Hello, and welcome back to another tour of our animals here at the Science Center. My name is Colin. I'm the curator of live exhibits here. I'm part of the small team that takes care of all of our critters, keeps them happy and healthy. We're going to do another animal room tour, though today we won't be in the animal room. Right now we're looking at our trout in the classroom tank, and after we've looked at this tank and talked about it for a little bit, we'll head over to the touch tank and talk about our critters over there. This trout in the classroom tank was put together as a collaboration with the folks at Discover Cayuga Lake. They run and administer the trout in the classroom program, which has tanks very similar to this one in, I think, all the four, fourth grade, not all the classrooms, but in all of the schools in our community uh, at the fourth grade level. It helps kids learn about our natural water system, eco water systems and ecosystems, and the critters that live in it, particularly the trout, but they study all levels of and aspects of ecology. And um, It's been a fun program. My daughter went through it last year and really enjoyed it. Her school put on a trout play, which was a lot of fun to watch. The trout in this tank are brown trout. They are one of the prominent trout you'll find in the area, though they aren't actually native. The brown trout are from Europe originally, but they've existed in New York waterways for a very long time, I believe well over a hundred years now. Brown trout are regularly stocked by the DEC in our waterways to encourage anglers and people to go out fishing and enjoy our natural habitats and spaces. These trout are now fingerlings. They've grown to a pretty good size. And they'll be released within the next month or so. Still trying to figure out how that will work. Hoping we might be able to do a socially distant release, but we'll certainly have some video release done. I know the folks at Discovery Q Lake are working hard to figure out the best way to make some lemonade in this time. Our native trout in this area are the brook trout, which we have featured in our thought they were going to get fed, which are in our native room. We've looked at those before, and I'm sure we'll, we'll look at them again. Oh, they're getting so excited. They're not due for another meal, but how can I turn them down? Let's throw some more pellets in there. You all can watch them gobble them up. Let's see how, they, how and why they grow so quickly. I always try to feed them enough to let a few pellets make it down to the bottom of the tank. And that way I know everybody's gotten at least a little bit. But they're growing like weeds now, just like my kids. It's hard to give them enough food to keep them going. The program, Trout in the Classroom, they, we start with, uh, last fall, we received little eyed eggs, they're called. They're eggs that are well developed the, the embryos in the eggs have developed an eye, which is where they get the name eyed eggs. And after we had them for a few days, maybe it was a week, um, those eggs begin to hatch in the first stage of little baby trout, they're called alvins. And it's a neat stage <coughs> where they're it's kind of in between a fish and an egg. They've come out of their egg, but they haven't absorbed their yolk sac yet. And they have a big yolk sac hanging off of their belly and they continue to absorb that yolk sac for the next week or two. It's what provides them energy. And they just sit on the bottom at this time. In the wild, it would be in a, in a the females will dig a shallow nest in a, in a rocky area of a cold, clean stream and lay her eggs there. And that's where the alvin will hang out until they've absorbed that yolk sac begun to become little fish and be able to swim and feed on their own. <coughs> uh, and then at that point they start swimming around looking for food and trying not to be food themselves. 
So this is a really fun tank. Unfortunately, by the time we open up, these fish will have all been released. However, I expect we'll do this tank again this coming year. So in the fall again, we'll get more eggs and raise them up all over again. Now I'm going to try to wheel you all over to the touch tank. I apologize if it's a bumpy ride. Got to deal with some cord management here. Back you all up a little bit. There we go. A funny little tidbit about this tank, the tank that these fish are in very first grand fish tank my parents ever bought me. This is a 50 gallon oceanic tank. And I had a pet Oscar when I was a kid. A big South American cichlid. It was a wonderful fish, and it, but it very quickly outgrew the 20 gallon tank we had for it. And so my mom very generously went out and bought me this great display tank to keep our Oscar in. We had him for a number of years before he passed away. And I've kept many different things in this tank. And then put it in storage for a long time and was excited to have the opportunity to dig it out and set it up for this Trout in the Classroom tank. It's fun to have it be used again. This tank has been in my life for probably three quarters of it now. Okay, let's head on over to the touch tank. Get a little glimpse at our exhibit gear up on our way over there. We've had this fun exhibit about bicycles here for a while now. I don't know exactly the schedule on it. I think it will likely be packed up and we'll have something else on the floor by the time we're open again. Our, that's our blank wall there. Poem by Rashad Richardson, who this gallery is named after. And here we get our first glimpse of our mural for our ocean gallery. We commissioned this mural for this ocean gallery uh, from a local artist, Paulina Glishkina. There's a, I think that's a ring-billed seagull. Paulina did a really phenomenal job painting many of the animals you would find in the habitat. Oh, velcro to the floor, one second. Our touch tank here is uh, supposed to be a northeastern tide pool, one that you would find perhaps on the coast of Maine. So we asked Paulina to paint us a mural. I'll try to give you all a broader look at it here. I can deal with my cords properly. So the theme of the mural. Starting over here is, the, is a forest in Maine with a number of little, uh, not little, but a number of creatures hidden off in the background which you see in the forest coming out to the coast. And there's a rocky shore that comes out to rocky outcroppings where you'd find this touch tank. And there's some of the birds you'd find. I have left my doors open. I apologize about that. Lose a little bit of the ambiance of the mural there. But you can see the forest and the rocks fading into the ocean here. Jeez, all my doors are open. There's a lobster boat with a whale breaching in the background. And then the mural transitions underwater over here. Hard to make out, but there's a seal swimming by on that door. And there's a sea turtle and some 
rocks down below with some reef creatures living on them. And there's a school of mackerel and a lobster hanging out down there. And then the lights... Oh, there we go. That worked out all right. We do have this hammerhead shark. Probably be fairly unusual to find a hammerhead off the coast of Maine. Uh, but an animal you do would find in our ocean and one that needs conserving. Shark populations all over are declining rapidly. And there's a, school, a number of cod swimming around this reef over here. And of course then that goes into our submersible submarine here. Where we have a great exhibit called Connect to the Ocean. Which was uh, a film put together by a local videographer, David Brown. Where uh, you get to take a trip from the creek right outside of the Science Center here. All the way out to the Atlantic Ocean. I find it a fascinating exhibit. It's really neat to be able to connect our waterways here, the water that falls on our land here and drains into our creeks and our lake, then flows all the way out to the ocean. And you can follow that video with a spin browser and take as much, much or as little time as you want to get all the way from, from our creek here out to the Atlantic Ocean. You can see many cool critters on the way. The Science Center has had a touch tank for many, many years now. We renovated uh, the touch tank and created this one about five years ago, I think it was. And we did that in part because our old touch tank was um, our old touch tank was a tropical touch tank. It had featured creatures from Indonesia and tropical creatures at that who live in, always in warm water. And while they were neat creatures, we really enjoyed that tank and those animals. It was, many people asked and wondered how it had to do with conservation and what we did here in Ithaca, how it would affect these creatures that lived on the other side of the planet. And while certain every action that we take has some effect, uh, it is the animals you'd find in the north and western Atlantic will be much more impacted by the things we do in our waterways than the animals on, over in the Pacific. And so when we got a decent grant to redo this tank, we switched it over to this northeast tide pool tank so that we could, and then along with our Connect to the Ocean exhibit, it's much easier to tie our activities here to these creatures Horseshoe crabs you can see there. And there come some mama chugs swimming into the scene. The mama chugs are the fish. These are a type of killifish. Last Tuesday when we looked at the planted tank, we saw our killifish in there, the American flagfish. These killifish, these mama chugs, are significantly larger. These guys, I'm not sure they're quite six inches long. They're certainly over four inches. These are large fish. These are some of probably the biggest mama chugs I've seen. Life is good for these fish in here. Life is quite easy. And these guys actually drive me crazy because when I'm trying to feed all the other creatures, these mama chugs come swimming along and gobble up all the food. But they're fun fish to have. The mama chugs are not generally saltwater fish. They're brackish fish. They live in uh, waterways that are entering out into the ocean where the fresh water has begun to mix with the salt water. So they have a fairly wide tolerance. We do keep, we keep our touch tank generally at full saltwater salinity or just a little bit low. Salt water is usually around 35 parts per thousand. And we keep this tank usually between 30 and 32 parts per thousand. So it's pretty close to salt water, but these fish do fine with it. Let me, while we've got a few animals Going off here, let me pull the camera down, try to get a closer look at some of them. Ah, always plagued by cord management. There we go. So there's our horseshoe crabs. One of our horseshoe crabs. Our horseshoe crabs are sort of the star of this tank. They're a really phenomenal creature. 
there have been horseshoe crabs living on the world of some sort for over 350 million years. At least we've found fossilized records that go back that far. And while those animals were a different species than this one, they look incredibly similar. There, that one just made it up over the lip, got into the shallow side of the tank, and it'll go cruising off, trying to find some food to scavenge up. Horseshoe crabs are scavengers, and they're omnivores as well. So they cruise around the bottom of the ocean, looking for food to gobble up. In a little bit, I'll try to grab one and I'll flip it over so we can see its underside. When, we, when I first started here at the Science Center, the plans were already in the works to create this touch tank. And it was in the plans to have horseshoe crabs. So when I started, I was told we'd have a touch tank with horseshoe crabs. And I was not very excited about it. I wasn't a huge fan of horseshoe crabs. As a kid growing up in the mid-Atlantic, going to the beaches on vacations, my brothers used to chase me around with horseshoe crabs and I was terrified of them. All of those creepy legs on the bottom, they look so scary. And many of our young guests that come to visit and check out our animals are also end up seeming quite nervous or afraid of the horseshoe crabs. But they're totally harmless. They've got some nasty looking things to try to keep predators from eating them, but uh, they really have almost no way to hurt anyone or anything. They just walk along looking for bits of food to scavenge up. So there's, there's three of our creatures right there. We've got the horseshoe crab, the mama chug, and there's one of our flat clawed hermit crabs. Trucking around, looks like the horseshoe crab might go tromping right over top of it. Pushing it out of the way. The horseshoe crabs are often like bulldozers in this tank. They just tromp around wherever they see fit. Horseshoe crabs are neat creatures. They have many, many eyes on them. They have these two large eyes. There's one of the large eyes. The other one's over on the other side over here. But then they've got lots of small eyes. Oh, if I can point to it, they're on the front of the horseshoe crab there. And back here on these tips. And apparently there's one even on the tail and some on the underside. They have lots more eyes. I think they have eight or ten eyes total. Um, met those smaller eyes are more like light sensors. The large eyes are like compound eyes, like a bee or an insect might have. And the small eyes are light receptors that help them see light and dark. Help them sort of figure out where they're going and what's ahead of them, what's behind them, so they can know where they are. And they have those long tails. Many people think those tails are stingers or are dangerous or are venomous or things like this. And none of that's true. They have those tails. Those tails help them flip themselves over. So if they get caught up in a wave or fall off a rock, and land on their back. They're able to arch their back and use that tail to help flip themselves over. So no danger at all. The worst danger a horseshoe crab poses is when you're handling one. If you get your finger caught near their hinge of their shell, they might pinch you by accident. Never intentionally, but that's about the worst thing that could happen with a horseshoe crab. They have such a successful design. As I mentioned, they've been around for hundreds of millions of years. They have that great hard exoskeleton, that great shell that keeps pretty much anything from eating them. There are perhaps a couple different shark species that may try chomping up horseshoe crabs. And probably a number of young horseshoe crabs in their first instars, their first stages as new ant creatures, might get eaten up as a plankton or, or by creatures that could eat such a small thing. But once they reach this adult size, they have virtually no predators. They'll live for 20 years. They don't reach maturity until they're about close to 10 years old. And then they'll live another 10 as adults. And they become adults when they reach their terminal molt. And that's when you can differentiate males from females. The females will lay up to 20,000 eggs at one time pretty phenomenal. They go into brackish water. These guys are primarily in the mid-east, uh, mid-Atlantic and the northeast. And their main breeding populations are where there is brackish water. So the Chesapeake Bay and uh, there are many on the Long Island Sounds and 
uh, Delaware, Cape May, I'm forgetting the term there. So all up and down the, the northeast coast, though they are found, I believe, as far south as Florida, maybe even a little further south, and up past Maine, up into Nova Scotia, I believe. So they have a pretty broad range. And they lay all those eggs, and there, is, there are species of birds who migrate, who have some of the longest migrations from South America all the way up to the Arctic tundra. And they time their migration to stop and gorge themselves on horseshoe crab eggs, which are very nutritious as a way to help make that long journey. And they've found, researchers have found, that when horseshoe crab populations crash, the, these migratory bird populations are not far behind them in crashing as well. Oh, and there's another one of our great creatures we have here in the touch tank. That's a Forb sea star making its way over the rock there. Sea stars are really cool creatures too. They've got lots of little tube feet on their underside, little suction cups that help them move around. And the ones on the ends of their legs or arms are sensory ones. They smell or taste the water, help them figure out where there might be some yummy food. And one of the coolest things about our ship, uh, sea stars, there's actually a number of super cool things. Like they don't have a brain, they just have a collection of a ring of nerves. It isn't a centralized brain, but still they're somehow able to do their thing without, without a brain. But they, uh, what I think the neatest thing about them is the way they eat. Sea star is, I believe, the only animal that digests its food outside of its body. These guys love to eat bivalves, clams, and mussels. Later today, I'll go by Wegmans and buy some mussels and clams to feed them. We we'll toss them live into the tank. The sea stars always know it. They get active and excited when I put them in the tank. They can smell them. And they track them down and jump on top of them. And then they use those tube feet to pry the shell open. They don't have to get it open very far. Just a couple millimeters even, I think, is enough. And then they actually eject their stomach. It's on the, their mouth is on the underside of their central disc. And so they pull that bivalve open a little bit and squeeze their stomach down into the bivalve. And, and their stomach then hangs out inside of the bivalve shell and releases digestive enzymes and actually digests the bivalve outside of their body. And when it's all gone and they're done eating, then they swallow their stomach back in. I always enjoy describing that to kids and asking them if they'd, they'd like to eat that way. Imagine sitting around the dinner table with your family and vomiting your stomach right out of your mouth and leaving it sit on your plate while it digests its food and then swallowing it all back down again. Pretty disgusting. Oh, there's a horseshoe crab demonstrating how they swim. That's fun. You can see all their legs and their book gills there. The book gills are the flaps on the back. There's their gills, how they respire, how they get rid of their CO2 and get oxygen out of the water. They flap their legs and their gills like that on their back. And it helps them swim along. They don't do it very often. But it's a neat thing to see when they do. We have a few other creatures that live in the tank here. We've got, uh, we might have some moon snails. I haven't found a moon snail recently. We've got some channeled whelks as well. Both of these are giant snails. There's some of our hermit crabs bickering with each other. These giant snails, the moon snails are cannibalistic. So we put a bunch in the tank, but they always end up eating each other up eventually. I didn't take the time before this tour to dig any up, and I'm not going to waste your time now digging through the sand, because they're good at hiding. It can be hard to find them. But when we open back up, I'd love to have you all come visit and check out, check out those critters. We've got a great team of volunteers, which is led by our spectacular keeper and educator, Emily. She does a great job getting them trained on the touch tank here. 
and they do a great job showing off all these critters to our guests. Well, thanks for joining me again for another Animal Room Tour. It's always fun to get to show off our critters. Can't wait till we're open again. We can do it all in person. A couple of other little tidbits to throw out there. Um, I'll be back again next Tuesday to do another tour at 2 o'clock. And then next Wednesday, I believe, the 20th, is, our, is the local Giving is Gorgeous campaign. It's an opportunity for many nonprofits in our area to, to try to raise some funds, which is ever important this is around now when we're all closed up and not able to run our normal programs. So check out the givingisgorgeous.org website next Wednesday. And if you have the means to, you certainly could use donations. I'm going to leave you all here on this tank for a while. I'm going to go grab some mussels and clams in just a minute. And I'll toss those in the tank. Maybe I'll be able to get a sea star on the front glass here with a mussel and maybe we'll be able to watch it eat. And then later in the day, I'll move you all back over to the animal room. Tomorrow, Friday, is Endangered Species Day. And so we're going to highlight we have a few endangered species we keep here at the Science Center. I think I'll set you all up with the axolotls. And you can check out the axolotls. They're critically endangered. There are very few of them left in the wild. Luckily, there are healthy populations of them in captivity, but their natural habitat has been degraded, polluted and degraded, and there are very few of them living in the wild now. They're generally now just found in drainage ditches around Mexico City. So we'll set you up on the axolotls later in the day and leave you there through tomorrow so you can check out and appreciate an endangered species. Well, thanks again for joining, and I look forward to seeing you all again. Take care, be safe, and stay healthy.